Welcome everyone. We'll be get, we'll be starting in about one minute. Welcome everyone just joining. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. Okay, Shalin, you can take it away. Thank you. Shalim, we can't hear you. Good we morning, go. all. Sorry about that. Now devices are all set to go. Um, I was saying good morning to all and, and good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're joining in from. Um, welcome to this session, Meet Ellen, the Future of Clean Maritime Transport, and quite an elegant title for our panel discussion here today. Um, I assure you, as exciting as the title sounds, uh, the presentations that make up this, this panel discussion will also be quite exciting. Um, I mean, just just thinking about the, the title of our of this panel, Meet Ellen. Again, um, thinking about the energy space, um, sustainability. We think of gender and energy, um, and that gives me a great segue to introduce myself, Charlene Bodley, project development and gender expert with the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency the SICRI. And the SICRI is just one of roughly 10 centers that make up a global network of sustainable energy centers around the world. And like its sister center, PICRI, you can imagine that the SICRI through its mandate and vision um, quite understands the island context as we serve um, many island states with our mandate. So at the SICRI, our um, aim is to transform the energy sector into one that's sustainable, climate resilient, and affordable, and all with the aim of, although this may sound cliche, but really it is with the aim of transforming lives. Um, and, and I think this fits so excellently into this um, panel discussion, meeting Ellen is she really the future of clean maritime transport? Um, it's a good time for me to recognize the sponsors of this session, Le Clanché. I hope my French has done this um, some justice. Um, a name that's known within um, this sector and, and, and the sector in, in which most of us, um, and I'm sure those attending work. And so we, this name is no stranger to you, um, synonymous with quality for sure. Um, Sea transportation uh, is really a, a huge livelihood factor for island states and, and island regions. Um, the Caribbean being one, um, the Pacific region, and of course, many other island states in the world. Of course, it's not unique to island states, but because of um, the uniqueness and vulnerabilities that island nations share, um, one can understand how crucial it is for trade, for regional integration, and ultimately for economic development. However, we are aware that island states still fall victim to um, unaffordable, unsustainable modes of maritime transport, and in, and in the worst of cases, um, even non-existent. So there is definitely strong potential for application across many sectors, including the tourism sectors, as many island nations depend so heavily on tourism. And it really boils down to the triple bottom line, people, profit, and the planet. And today's discussion, today's presentations will really bring out these three areas. How um, are the, the recent technological advancements um, in, the, in the maritime space and industry, how are they helping us to save the environment, to, to, to do much better, to meet our international commitments in reducing CO2 emissions? How are they 
um, helping to transform the lives of our people socially? Um, what are the economic benefits? And um, the CICRI, as the, the center, the implementation hub for energy in the Caribbean region, uh, along with its partner CARICOM Energy Program, is leading the development of a regional electric vehicle strategy. Um, and with that strategy, we must consider what we perceive to be the pillars of a transition. And this, of course, applies to the maritime space. And, and so I think our presentations that will follow will definitely um, touch on these pillars and, and they include technology and infrastructure as one. Um, secondly, finance, market development and innovation. Um, also uh, regulation and a policy. And last but not least, and as we meet Ellen, I'm sure we're going to hear a little more about how Ellen has impacted the people and what was required. Um, and it really means that we take Ellen from the lab into the sea, into the land, into the life of the people. And so with that comes, of course, um, gleaning what's necessary where capacity development and awareness is, um, is considered. And so without further ado, uh, I hope this introduction has given you just a, a, a snapshot of what you can expect these discussion points to be fe featured in our presentations today. And so I, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker as we look at the technological aspects of um, electrifying our maritime transport space. Um, and it's no other than Mr. Dean Jennings. And Mr. Jennings is the Vice President of eMarine Le Clanchet. He is um, by far an accomplished marine industry executive with over 10 years engineering, business development, and management experience. Having joined Le Clanchet in October of 2018, as the vice president of the company, the company's e-marine business and part of his e-transport group, he is responsible for the complete direction of the business, including product development, sales, engineering, and customer support. Previously, Dean was regional sales manager of communication systems at Eaton, marketing its hazardous area communications portfolio. And prior to joining Eaton, he served as sales manager, offshore production systems for Consberg Maritime, delivering marine automation systems to the, to the oil and gas sector. Jennings spent more than 11 years at ABB Marine, another big name in the industry, rising in the ranks from senior installation and commissioning service engineer to serving as technical account manager. He began his career serving in the British Royal Navy for 10 years on minesweeping frigates. Dean graduated from the Royal Navy School of Engineering with a Bachelor of Science in Marine Electrical Engineering and allow me to wish him the very best as he is currently pursuing an MBA. Over to you, Dean. Thank you very much, uh, Charlene. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, welcome uh, to an introduction to Ellen. As uh, Charlene says, my name is Dean Jennings. Now, let me let 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 your mind wander for a second, because what I'm about, what you're about to witness here, is a is a global first. What what we've created is a the, the world's first 100% electric ferry and at the time, the world's largest. And when I say electric, I mean everything from the drives, from the motors, from the thrusters, from the lighting, from the coffee machine, uh, everything. If you can carry 200 passengers, 31 cars, or five trucks and eight cars, she is non-polluting. No CO2, no sulfur dioxide. Let me tell you, I've, I've sailed on her uh, and, and there's, you know, there's zero pollution, there's zero noise, significantly much less um, uh, um, vibration, uh, which gives the, the, the passengers much more comfort. My goal in this, in present, in this presentation is to give you a, an introduction into Ellen and the technology that made her possible. First, I'll, I'll provide you a little bit of background on our heartbeat, uh, the Leclanche system. 
a short introduction to the Laconchi then. We, we have been providing energy storage solutions since 1909. So we've been around for quite some time. The company discontinued the production of alkaline batteries and, and reconverted to lithium ion technology with a massive investment over the last, uh, last decade. Our state-of-the-art facility in, in Germany, delivering our pouch cell technology for both lithium titanate oxide and, and GNMC chemistries with a new module manufacturing line in, in, in our HQ in Switzerland to fully industrialize the process for this electric, electrification revolution. A key differentiator for, for our clients and, and the reason they come to us is, uh, you know, we're a fully turnkey integrated system provider for high energy and high power um, cells, uh, battery management systems, remote logging, uh, and it's all from one provider and one European provider at that. We have three business, three main business units, units that, that make up Laconche, the stationary business, providing supplementary grid applications, speciality, delivering custom batteries for a wide range of smaller sectors. And finally, but not least, uh, the e-transport the e business unit, providing high cycle and high energy density battery solutions for the marine, rail, and commercial vehicle applications. Okay, so why Ellen and why is this relevant today? Ocean freight or seagoing freight is the most common form of transport for importers and exporters, accounting for 90% of goods transported globally. So like it or not, we all consume and we all contribute to the CO2 emissions. The IMO or the International Maritime Organization is the United Nations specialized agency with responsibility for safety and security of shipping and prevention of marine pollution by ships. This society has set ambitious targets for stabilizing mean global temperature. To attain these targets, it has to reduce CO2 emissions to near zero by mid-century and subsequently remove CO2 from the atmosphere during the latter half of the century. With solutions such as Ellen, we have the option to significantly reduce that rate of consumption. Okay, so, so some of the barriers that, that were tackled during this project, costly batteries and rare metals. Um, we've, we've all heard that they, you know, they, they, they can be extremely costly. Battery prices in the, uh, in the last six years have significantly decreased year on year. And that trend looks like uh, continuing with, uh, with additional further uh, technologies uh, in, a, in a hope to, to facilitate further projects like Ellen. Limited range of pure plug-in battery operation. Yes, it is, a, it, it is an, or was a limiting factor. We solved it. Ellen, at the time, is the largest fully electric system, allowing Ellen to sail 10 times longer than any other e-ferry, some 22 nautical miles, or 40 kilometers if you're a land lover. Um, safety in electrical, uh, electrical operation and maritime uh, operation is key. You know, during the, uh, the development of Ellen, we developed uh, with, a, with, 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 a, with the remaining partners, you know, firefighting systems with biodegradable foam solutions to uh, combat any fire propagation redundancy throughout the vessel, training, uh, and I'm sure Sphere will touch on uh, it some more, uh, maritime certification of battery systems. It's a new thing in the maritime world. And we have to uh, adhere, to, uh, adhere to regulations uh, and specifications set down by the, the, the governing bodies. Energy efficiency and, and propulsion systems uh, on vessels. Again, solved that. I mean, the actual energy efficiency of Ellen was predicted to be much lower than what it's turned out to be. We're now at uh, Ellen is 85% uh, efficient, even better than the projected numbers, which were 20 to 30% losses. 
charging infrastructure and power from the grid. Uh, Ellen is, 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 I'm sure, not unique, but uh, you know there was a, some record-breaking uh, uh, innovations that uh, took place uh, uh, during during the development. One of those was uh, uh, the uh, the plug size for uh, charging Ellen is 6,000 amperes. Uh, with propagation barriers, which were completely bespoke uh, to this project. So lots of innovations, lots of barriers tackled. If you could prepare the, the, uh, the, the video, I, I, I'll, I'll do a short uh, introduction. Now, islands have, have been stuck in a, in a rock and a hard place regarding transit. On one hand, they, they require vessels for transport and trading. And on the other hand, boats and ferries running on diesel fuel, pollute the air and the water of the very islands that they serve. Environmental concerns have finally gone mainstream. Industry and governments have joined forces using carbon reduced regulations and expanding range of cleaner energy alternatives. And with Ellen, we have the solution. So please, without further ado, please meet Ellen, 100% electrical ferry powered by La Clanche Battery. So thank you. So just to recap oh, oh, in, in, with some numbers then, the, the fully electric ship Ellen is, is to ferries what uh, supercar is to series production. And indeed, she's the first not to have a, a backup motor or diesel emergency generator on board. So she really is the Tesla of the sea. You know, instead, she has the largest battery uh, pack uh, currently at 4.3 megawatt hours. The, the Danfoss drive train providing 1.5 megawatts of thrust for her maneuvering. And she covers just over 40 kilometers or 22 nautical miles between ports and charges. She will save uh, estimated uh, um, uh, 2000 tons of CO2 per year. And with battery service life of some 10 years, that's a lot of savings uh, to the environment and not to mention fuel savings. So where do we go? What do we, what do we do next? And where do we go from here? As I mentioned at the start, IMO regulations have strict guidelines to reduce the emissions in maritime sector by 40% in the year 2013. I mean, maritime world, that's just around the corner. 
you know, the, the transition is underway. However, we're a long way, we have a long way to go. Many early adopters such as the, the Nordics, uh, Norway in particular, and Canada are showing the way. Um, and what does this mean for the maritime industry? Invariably, it means we, we will never again build ships without consideration for the emissions uh, that, are, that are being produced. So uh, clearly a good thing. The, the top in, infographic uh, perhaps tells us a little bit more in, in, in words and I, uh, so I'll close with that, uh, that, that, that uh, link and let that sink in a little bit. But uh, the bottom uh, infographic shows the forecast of, of, of battery only solutions for the next five years. So although we are, as I said, we're underway, you can see that the, the, the Norway are building perhaps two times as many, um, uh, two times as many uh, battery vessels globally uh, than, than uh, so therefore we need to, we need to step up and, and be counted and make a difference. Uh, the technology is there, um, we need to grasp it for further. Uh, I hope you hopefully you can all see the slide, but uh, it, it's showing how the uh, the uh, the uh, the amount of uh, emissions that uh, transport is is emitting compared to other industries globally. Uh, it really is quite significant. So, Dean, for the last few minutes, we have okay. been unable to see your screen. Okay, I do apologize. Let me. I'm not just... sure if you want to just. Um, put that back yeah. up on screen. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, let me just double check that. Can you see that? Yes, we can. You can. You can. You see, not without the notes, no. Yes, without the notes. We're seeing your screen and we're okay. seeing the animation. Okay, let me just sort of back up just very, very quickly then. Yeah. So you know, as I said, uh, you know, with regards to uh, emissions uh, globally within the sector. That we have to reduce them by 40% by, re by regulation. That's a significant way to go in a very short period of time, you know. And again, the 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 infographic uh, of which I'll, I'll finish with tells a little bit more than I can than I can say. Uh, and 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 I think certainly from uh, uh, what is being built at present. Um, in the, the Norwegians are the Norwegians and the and the, uh, uh, the Canadians are showing the way, but they're building two times as many uh, certainly battery type vessels um, than, than anybody else globally. So we all need to step up to to the plate uh, and, and make the difference. But as I said, to finish, the the technology is there. Just a very very briefly again, just to show you the. Uh, the, the difference with regards to transport, including shipping and aviation, of course, compared to the other uh, industry sectors, but really significant. And we can really make the we can really make the difference in our, in, in our industry. So thank you, Charlene. Thank you for everybody uh, for listening. Hopefully, you managed to catch the last few slides there. Um, uh, we look forward to the the rest of the panel discussion and to your to your questions. Afdan and Svera will, I'm sure, give you further insight into what is a wonderful vessel. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, for such a wonderful introduction to Ellen. And I note that you refer to her as the Tesla of the sea. Um, I would just um, ask the panelists as we go through to just. Um, perhaps start looking at the questions in the chat. Uh, we do have some questions here relating to uh, the affordability of Ellen, um, the dispatchability of Ellen, um, even in, in larger numbers in a fleet um, and how much that would cost. Uh, of course, since we're likening Ellen to the Tesla of the sea, that is going to be an important conversation. Ladies, gentlemen, around the globe, you've heard um, about the technology. Uh, definitely sounds future-proof. Um, and not only have you heard about the technology, you know, products being optimized um, with optimized performance and efficiency, with an efficiency of as high as 85%, quite impressive. Um, but you've heard about a real life example already introduced into a fleet and changing, I imagine, transforming the lives of the people in Airo. 
And so this is a great opportunity to introduce our second speaker as we move away from the technology in the lab and we move into the sea and, and the people and the land. And I am very pleased to introduce Mr. Hafton Abramson, uh, who is the information manager at Iro Energy Lab. And Iro Energy Lab develops and manages renewable energy projects on the island of Iro, Denmark. Abramson holds a master's degree in English and media and has previously been employed in the Danish states in the educational sector. However, and as you will glean from his presentation, his deep interest in environmental matters and environmental policy and philosophy has led him to Iro, where he enjoys the opportunity to mediate new environmental technologies and policies and have done through his work um, and involvement in the Ellen project is uh, very well suited to give us some insight of the practical, um, the practical life of Ellen in the island of Aero. Half done. Thank you for the uh, introduction and uh, hello to everyone around the world. I am very excited to be here. I'm very excited to talk to other islanders because uh, we have special challenges, but um, we also, I think we share a common um, desire to do things independently and to not be dependent of the mainland where we we, we, we uh, get supplies, et cetera, but we try to be independent and do it on our own. And that means that innovation is something that, that I think happens a lot on islands. Uh, people do it their own way. And uh, I have to say on a personal level, I'm extremely excited to be here because uh, I am uh, no longer doing a bureaucratic office work but I am actually dealing with a solution that uh, is sailing. And, and typically when you have an, an environmental solution, you have to pay extra money uh, to pay for it. But the special thing about Ellen is that not only does it significantly reduce our uh, island's uh, emissions, it's also cheaper uh, uh, for our operator, which is owned by the municipality. And uh, I think it came as a bit of a surprise to many how much cheaper it is. And I can only echo what uh, Dean said. We have uh, moved to a new era and we're not going to go back because there's no reason to, neither financially nor environmentally. And uh, we know what, uh, what is at stake now with uh, global climate change. So I hope to see more ferries around the world soon, uh, just like Ellen. And, um, I will uh, share my uh, my uh, slideshow here just a second. And um, this is just to give you an idea about where I'm located. Uh, Denmark is a small country, uh, the, the, the southernmost uh, of the Scandinavian countries just north of uh, Germany. And I have circled uh, the, the small island here called Eru. And uh, we, uh, we are only 6,000 people here. So, uh, so it, it, has been an, uh, it has been exciting for, for al almost everyone on the island, I would say, because everyone knows what goes on everywhere. And uh, there's, there's a lot of pride now about Ellen and, and, and all the good uh, connections we get from, from Ellen. Um, the thing about uh, uh, Eru as an island is that uh, we are really used to making things happen on our own. Uh, during the first oil crisis in the 70s, uh, locals actually started already back then uh, with solar panels. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, we now produce more than we use uh, with uh, electricity. Uh, with our six uh, windmills and the sun produces 55% of our district heating. And for those who don't know, district heating is central heating station where the whole town gets uh, warm water centrally from, from that. And so everyone here in Master, where I live, the town where I live, 
gets uh, warm water from, from the central heating. And it's owned by locals. Both the windmills and the district heating is owned by locals. And I like to say that uh, windmills are pretty uh, ugly when, you, uh, when they are owned by a big uh, power company somewhere off on the mainland that you never see any uh, money return. But when you own them yourself, that makes a big difference. Then they are beautiful. <laughs> both because of what they mean environmentally, but also because what they mean uh, economically. And it means that we are quite independent also in, in this case, and that's a good feeling. But it's a cooperative thing. Stocks are at a fixed price. There's no uh, interest or, or there's, 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 it's, it's not like regular stocks, but, uh, but uh, you make a little bit of money each year but you own it yourself and that's the important part. Uh, the transport sector on AOR is quite a challenge. Uh, of course, we have, uh, we have four ferries, uh, uh, municipality owned ferries, and uh, one of them is Ellen. Uh, but all our buildings are, are, are emission free, ferries and buses remain the challenge. Um, Buses are expensive. We are now seeking funds to to uh, help buy uh, emission-free buses, but it's it's a it's a lot of money. Uh, the e-ferry also came from private initiative here on the island. Locals got together. Of course, there's a lot of sailors here on the island, and uh, sometimes we uh, we the politicians say, "Yeah, there's a six thousand." The heads of uh, the ferry department on A, or they can't do anything regarding ferries without a lot of people joining in to comment on what they think. But there was actually not too much resistance about uh, the idea of Ellen because it it, it was it was it just sounded so interesting, and for I for for maritime people to be able to do something like that, that's that's something that sort of turns them on. Uh, uh, technologically, etc. Um, now, Ellen was not uh, exactly uh, cheap to build. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see what we actually spent on Ellen, developing Ellen, 30 million euro altogether. And uh, the cake there shows what we spent the money on. Now, the red part is uh, research, development, information, and administration. Uh, just uh, administering the, the the project. It was a large project with nine European partners. And the reason for that uh, was uh, was not least, least that we got funding from EU's Horizon 2020 program. Uh, they support uh, a lot of green projects. Um, and and But to be able to get that funding, we actually got 15 million euros. So. It was a big, big deal. Uh, we had to spread sort of the uh, the uh, idea to to across Europe, but and and that has been extremely exciting. Working with so many different partners, different languages, different cultures, it has also been challenging sometimes, but uh, exciting, and it's great to be able to share the the accolades or, or whatever you can call it with with uh, people uh, around uh, across Europe. Um, having said that, uh, a new ferry is much, much cheaper. Uh, we have made an estimate that says 16 million oil for a new ferry. Um, and we have broken down the cost. These costs are from a, our evaluation report. Everyone can request it. Uh, you can write to me on the email that uh, you see on the bottom right of every screen here. And you can simply just request it, and you will you will you will be sent the evaluation report. It's 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 quite dense and uh, nerdy, but uh, but I think many would find it interesting. Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, and um, I would just like to say that uh, that the land part is a big thing. You can't just project buying an electric ferry uh, because it, it's, it, it swallows a lot of electricity. So we have four 1.2 megawatt transformers. Those are huge transformers. And, uh, and they deliver the power. 
we can actually charge in just one hour, which is quite amazing, actually. It's, it's, it, Ellen can hold what about a, a household, a common household in, in Denmark uses in, during one year. So there's a lot of energy going in in one hour if need be. But we don't do that because there's no reason to... Uh, to uh, overtax the batteries by, by supercharging. So, but we charge during the night and uh, we, our charger is based on a ramp. Um, so it follows the various movements. And on the bottom of the screen, you can see a state of the charge of the batteries. Uh, they are charged at night, then we spend the energy. And when we get back to home port, then we just charge a little bit, use some more, charge a little bit when we get back again, etc. Then we have a long break where we charge again a lot. And that means that we can maintain a high frequency because we have really a spare energy. But before we go to the next slide, and I, I think I need to wrap up pretty soon here, uh, I would like to just show a video of the evaluation results. So if you would stop the, uh, the video. Okay, I hope that, that that just gave you a brief uh, insight into the evaluation results. Uh, in any case, um, one moment here. Um, I, I'm just about done, uh, time is running out, but I just want to show you here this, this graph about the economy that shows that a fully electric ferry is the cheapest solution. Already after four years, if the land part is already in place, a, a bit further, uh, uh, a bit more years, if you have to build the land facilities also. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, just end by saying that uh, the impact of Ellen on the island of Aeor has been great. Uh, we get in incredible amounts of uh, uh, contacts. Uh, people come here weekly to see the ferry this year, government represents, rep, rep, representatives from two European nations has been here to see Ellen because they want to implement something similar. And uh, there are new jobs created. Uh, our navigation school has the world's first e-courses or the first courses in, in, uh, in sailing uh, fully electric. So there are many benefits uh, and we, we are just so happy that, that this could happen. And I think my time is up now, or is that is that right? <laughs> um. Thank you so much, Hafdan. Um, I'm sure our viewers and listeners would rather you continue, and I'm sure they have plenty of questions that will follow your presentation. But um, definitely my main takeaways from this presentation um, is proof of, of what I started by saying. Um, really, Ellen seems to be the epitome of the triple bottom line, people, profits, and planet. So the environmental uh, factors, the environmental saves, um, the impact, the positive impact on the people, you mentioned the job creation and that social benefit that comes out of it. And of course, the economics, very interesting that you mentioned the difference in the, the, the price, the difference in the economics between Ellen as a prototype and um, generations or offspring of Ellen to come. Um, that's a very uh, noteworthy point. Um, and as an Islander myself, I note that you began really laying um, 
the context and, and the opportunities that exist for island states, opportunities that force us to be innovative, opportunities that force us to be creative. And as a resilient people, um, we really do make things happen. Um, and I, I just really love the fact that, that in Aero, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> that there is that um, cooperative approach and that sense of ownership surrounding Ellen and um, her offspring to come. So I want to thank you for that presentation. We look forward to um, more from you as we uh, proceed to the, the, the third presentation and then into the discussion bit okay. of our panel. So thank you very, very much. And ladies, gentlemen um, from across the world, you've heard about Ellen, you've seen the proof of concept. Um, and now you've you've even had a chance to glean some of what is possible uh, for the future, the replicability of Ellen. Um, and moving into the future, looking at, at the future view, and, and this is no longer a, a matter of can island states and other countries um, replicate such a project within the next 10 years. This is, this is really the now. Um, and understanding that is the now, we've heard about the technology, we've heard about the infrastructural requirements to make this possible and successful. Um, and I am very happy that the next presentation touches on another very key factor, and that is um, regulation. We, we've already touched a little on the safety required, the, the safety measures that are required, um, certification, and really all what is required to make this um, industry mainstream. And it is my distinct pleasure to invite, to, to, to tell us about that um, and to benefit from his expertise, Mr. Svera Eriksson. And Svera is a senior principal approval engineer um, for electrical systems at DNVGL Maritime. Again, another huge name in the industry. Svera Eriksson is senior principal approval engineer for the NVGL Maritime based in Norway. And the NVGL Maritime is the world's leading classification society and a recognized advisor for the maritime industry. Um, the NVGL Maritime enhances safety, quality, energy efficiency, and environmental performance of the global shipping industry across all vessel types and offshore structures. Svera joined the NVGL Maritime in 2008, and he has worked with electrification of ships since 2011, um, being greatly a part of the evaluation and monitoring for the safety of battery installations on board many ships. He has also been responsible for developing the DNVGL class rules for battery powered ships. Ericsson has a Master of Science degree in Electric Power Engineering from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Sveta. Thank you, Charlene. So, um, my name is Sveta Eriksson. I'm uh, working in a company called DNVGL. Uh, I'm located in uh, Norway, and I have had the pleasure to be involved in several uh, electrification of uh, vessels. Uh, um, and just to be short about my company, um, DNVGL is a merge between the Norske Veritas and the uh, German company Germanische Lloyds. Uh, and we do classification of uh, vessels, so it's safe to sail. Uh, we do certification and verification and test against regulatory requirements. And we also, uh, and that's important in this context, we do development of new rules, standard and recommended practices. And when you have a new technology like batteries that is supposed to uh, propel the vessels, then there is in the beginning no rules or standards. So we had to develop our uh, own uh, rules together with the industry and the uh, flag states and so on. Uh, so for uh, Elm, uh, it has been uh, verified against our classification rules. 
Um, in addition, we do um, technology qualification. So uh, if you come up with a new battery technology or whatever it is, uh, we can help the makers to, to verify the technology and see where the um, problems are or where the non-problems are. In addition, we also do some advisory works with respect to safety, technology, data management, cybersecurity, efficiency, uh, and so on. So, but what about L? Is the vessel safe? That is my uh, job in this project, or was my job in this project. So, um, and as I told you, there was developed uh, class rules for doing this. And we were um, concerned about batteries that uh, could be thermal instable. So we had a lot of focus on the battery installation itself. We required that we need a certification of the batteries. So, uh, for instance, um, we uh, required that they should put the battery on fire. And uh, not the whole battery, but a part of it. Uh, they start with a cell, heat it up so it's uh, igniting, and see how the fire is spreading through the battery system. And um, the pass criteria was that it should stop at least uh, within uh, one module, a block of the, the battery system. And we require that they repeated the test three times. So Leclanché has to <laughs> go to Finland to a fire research laboratory and they put the batteries on fire and successfully done it three times. And it is. So if there is a fire starting inside due to a failure in a battery cell or something like that, like you had all these Samsung batteries that caught fire on the mobile phone, or this Boeing uh, uh, Dreamliner uh, planes that uh, had this problem, then the fire will be extinguished within uh, or with stop within the system. And of course, uh, there is rules that uh, you have uh, protection of the battery system installation on board the vessel so that if there is an incident, uh, the failure will be uh, kept within that battery space. One other very important aspect is when you're running on batteries all alone is that you know that you have sufficient capacity on your batteries. For instance, on your PC or your mobile phone, you have this small bar graph telling that you have 100% available, you have 80% uh, available power or something like that. Um, and uh, of course, uh, when the, your mobile laptop or whatever it is, is starting to getting old. Uh, you put it, you charge it, with, and then you charge it within uh, one hour instead of three hours, and you get it to 100%. And that's because uh, the, or the capacity of the battery is not as good as it was when it was new. So you get uh, up to 100% voltage very fast, but you actually doesn't have the correct capacity. And then this is important on board a vessel. So you need to take care of the state of health of the battery and compare the actual capacity compared to a new battery. And all these things are put in uh, place uh, on uh, the Ellen Ferry. So for the Ellen Ferry, we have certified a lot of the components that are essential or important on board. And we have issued a class certificate, so it's a safe vessel. And in this project, we have also cooperation with the Danish Maritime Authority and worked uh, together with them. So, uh, and then I would like to just tell you what, what, is, what is happening. Uh, uh, here in, in Norway, where I'm living, there is a lot of uh, electrification project, but there is also electrification of vessels uh, all the places around the world. So if you look at these this bar graphs, back in 2011, we had two projects ongoing and, and these projects are 
uh, hybrid projects and very many vessels are hybrid. So they have both batteries or, and diesel engines or LNG fueled engines uh, or bio diesel engines. Um, so, uh, and the blue color is the ongoing project that are being built and the red one is those one out sailing. So in 2013, the two first vessels were out there sailing that could be propelled by the vessels. Uh, this was hybrid vessels. Um, and as you see now in 2020 up to now, we have 230 projects, which uh, 120 of them are sailing and 110 of them are under building. So it's picking up a lot and actually, there is a new project coming each week and one project is finalized each week. So it's it's very cool to see this trend. So, but uh, you never know. <laughs> you know, if you have a big sea going vessel, of course you can't propel that vessel to cross the Atlantic. So then you need to build a hybrid vessel. I would, also like the opportunity to just show you some of the project uh, we have been involved in. This uh, Ampere ferry uh, from Norway uh, uh, was put in operation in 2015. It was the first uh, uh, fully battery powered uh, uh, electric passenger and car ferry, uh, but it did have an um, emergency generator that is running on diesel. The cool thing about this project was that um, uh, the power grid on the, the shore sides were uh, rather weak. So to, to help out with that, uh, to be able to charge the vessel within nine minutes, because that was the stop before it has to go to the other uh, harbor, then they had to put in additional batteries. So companies like Le Clanche and other battery makers are very happy when the, when the grid is weak because then they sell more batteries, but it does work. So then you slowly charge the shore batteries while the vessel is sailing. And when the sailing is, the vessel is coming back, it has enough energy stored to uh, fast charging the ferry. Um, here is another vessel. Now we are moving to Iceland and to the uh, uh, island Vestmanner Air. Um, and uh, this vessel is called Herjolve, if my Icelandic language is uh, correct. Um, this is a vessel that is transporting from the main line of, of the island, uh, Iceland, to the, to the island Vestmanner Air. And uh, it's uh, a place where they have a lot of uh, fishery. So the most important thing that are on that vessel is fish and together with the cars and, uh, and uh, passengers. And um, this vessel is a hybrid vessel. Uh, it is uh, when the weather is good, they will propel it on batteries all alone. Uh, but when it's hard or harsh uh, weather, they will need uh, the diesels to run in uh, parallel. And then there is another vessel. This is a rather big uh, vessel, almost like a cruise vessel. It's going between Sweden and Norway. This vessel is also a hybrid vessel, but it has this operation mode of zero emission. So when it's 30 minutes away from the uh, shore side, it turns off all the diesels and it's run on batteries all alone for the last uh, half an hour and then charge it uh, while the passengers are going off and on and then sailing out again uh, for half an hour before the diesels are turned on. And that is very great for the local pollution. So then you can see the sun, even though uh, maybe not shown on this picture. <laughs> uh, one last uh, example is a sightseeing boat. Uh, it's going in a fjord on the western coast of Norway. It's maybe look more like an opera house. It could have 400 passengers. But the interesting thing here is the power dock. So you see this docking area. This is filled with batteries. So it's just like the first Ampere ferry I showed you. 
uh, here they have a combined uh, uh, key and uh, a power station. So, so that's a, a very cool solution. So that was what I was planning to tell you. Charlene. Thank you, Sven. Very, very interesting. Um, and, and we're seeing that apart from Ellen, we have some other um, great examples around the world. I will um, go straight into questions noting that we have half an hour and I really want to give our participants an opportunity to pose their questions and, and so I have noted some of the questions and I'm, I'm going to start especially since you've mentioned all these um, examples and, and they seem to be within um, the European context and, and for me this question is is quite relevant being a Caribbean island girl um, so, so this question I open to any of the panelists who may wish to answer um, is this type of, of transportation, these e-vessels, are they feasible for the context of small island developing states? And I know it's an ongoing conversation. So while we have proven the economy or the economics of Ellen and Ampe and, and, and these other ships, um, if these projects have to be scaled to meet the needs of small island developing states and their context, is it a feasible option? Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, well, Sorry? I would just like to say that, uh, yes, it is feasible. However, there's one important thing to note, and that is you need the power to, a power grid that can uh, deliver the kind of power without creating blackouts in, uh, in uh, communities. Uh, so that's something to notice, but, uh, but otherwise I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be just as uh, possible in even smaller islands than, than Aero. Yeah, I mean, just to, for, for me to echo both what Hafdan uh, and Svera have said there in, the, uh, uh, in their, both of their presentations, the the Aero uh, ferry uh, and and Ellen itself are important and 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 yes it's feasible, but without the shoreside technology uh, and and having the infrastructure shoreside, it really does um, it uh, it really becomes a little bit more uh, involved. Uh, these can uh, there's many ways to uh, to to get over these uh, uh, with uh, I think uh, uh, as you see from uh, uh, from half Dan's presentation with wind and solar but also with battery technologies on the on the shore side uh, as well um, in fact uh, in uh, one of our latest projects in Ontario we're doing that very same thing so we, we there is a there is a, a a weakness in the infrastructure on the shore side, and we're delivering a buffer station uh, from uh, that's been fed from the grid to to charge batteries. And as the as the vessel transitions across the uh, across the water, to uh, we we trickle charge the battery, and then when it comes back across, we can we can charge with the with it up to a a, a good state of uh, a good uh, sorry uh, depth of discharge. It's kind of the same sort of idea uh, as the uh, the power dock that uh, Sphere uh, indicated to. So a buffer station, yeah. So uh, in, in essence, Charlene, it is extremely feasible. Yeah. Um, maybe I can also add in, um, if you don't go fully electric, but you go for a hybrid uh, vessel where you have assistance of the battery and you actually charge and the batteries from the engines that are on, driven on diesels or biofuels or something, you can gain uh, efficiency uh, uh, margins. So that uh, depending on the operation, but if you have a, a ferry that starts and stops a lot and, and, and so on, it might be feasible also to have a hybrid vessel. Thank you, panelists, for your responses. Um, I, our next question was incidentally about the charging infrastructure required, so the shore side technology that is required. I believe um, all of you have, have sort of touched on that. Um, but to, to just go into the next question, sort of related, um, how long does it take to charge Ellen? That is a question here from one of our participants. 
Well, we can charge in just one hour, uh, which is quite amazing. It's called charging at 1C uh, uh, because we have uh, 4.3 uh, megawatt hour and uh, in the batteries and uh, and can charge basically uh, that in one hour. But but uh, we choose to charge uh, uh, not so fast. Uh, but but maybe Dean, you can say something about how to. What, what is good practice in charging batteries? Yeah, I mean, ultimately to get the longevity from the from the system and, and we, we size a system for typically in marine and spheral, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically we're looking at an eight to eight to 10 year life uh, of, of these batteries. So we need to size and dimension them correctly. Now, uh, uh, yes, we could, uh, we could charge a, uh, a battery system at uh, a, 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 a higher rate of charge than what we call 1C, which is one hour. But invariably, it will reduce the, 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 the capacity or life of the, of the specific um, uh, battery from perhaps eight to 10 years to, uh, to, uh, to uh, and, and significantly reduce that. So we have to watch it. We have to make sure that that is, is fit for purpose for the, for the life of the asset uh, to, to, to ensure that operationally, the operational profile that, 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 that we're given from the, from the outset, it meets uh, and hopefully exceeds that. So um, yeah, I hope, I hope hopefully that sort of kind of answered your, answered your question there. It, it's, it is specific and we have different technologies or, and chemistries to meet a, uh, perhaps a, a higher rate of charge. So if you have a, a water taxi or, or perhaps like uh, uh, Ampere, uh, which is being, uh, is going across and has to charge a lot quicker, perhaps it can use a different chemistry. So we'll look at that from a, from a, from a, a chemistry point of view, actually, from the, from the, from the get-go uh, and, and size accordingly the battery pack for a, a fully electric or a, a hybrid, a hybrid solution. Thank you, um, Dean and Sfer. Um And we have another question here uh, relating to a transition. So if we were to replace all the existing ships with Ellen, how do we deal with the old ships? Um, question that comes up when we speak about electrifying ground transport also. Um, and a second part to that question, and this question is from Umida Slevokska. Uh, thank you for your question and thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, so question two from, from this participant is, can you power existing ships with your electrification solution? I imagine this question relates to whether or not it is feasible to um, retrofit existing ships to take on that electric, um, electric propulsion. I, th I think, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pitch in very quickly here. I mean, yes, uh, in short, we cannot, um, a battery cannot facilitate every single vessel globally. Uh, as Sphere indicated there uh, during his presentation, range is a factor, okay? So when we're talking about short range, and, and, and as this is an island forum, when we're talking about island nations and island states, we can, um, we can uh, utilize battery and hybrid solutions for relatively short distance. We can't, we can't cross the uh, Atlantic, for instance. We would need sort of a, a, a combination of solutions, LNG, diesel, bio, biofuels, and perhaps, as, as uh, Sfera indicated, when we come into uh, a harbor location or a ports and harbors, then you transition to, the, to a battery solution. And, and we, are, we are developing with uh, some key partners that very sort of solution uh, where we uh, where we will uh, utilize the battery for the last half an hour or last 40, 40 minutes or or in fact when a vessel is in a port and harbor so we're not um, if you're in a in a beautiful place like venice uh, for argument's sake on a on a on a uh, or, or for argument's sake in the Caribbean on, a, on a, a, a cruise vessel, then you're not seeing plumes of dark black smoke coming out of the funnel. You can, we, can, we can ultimately in, uh, uh, reduce and, uh, uh, and negate that utilizing uh, alternative fuels. 
Yes, maybe I can also fill in. Um, what we have seen so far is uh, the 230 projects I told you about, and uh, uh, about 30% of them are retrofit uh, projects where they do put in uh, batteries to make the vessels hybrid. And that is to make the possibility for a zero emission uh, um, operation, but also for uh, uh, peak shaving to just reduce fuel consumption. So, so um, but of course you need a vessel that are fit for putting in a battery. So, so if you have electric propulsion in the beginning, it's much easier than if you have an uh, uh, old uh, directly driven uh, propeller from a, a diesel engine. And maybe just, sorry, yeah, go on. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe just to, just to add some weight to, I think what Sver was saying there is that a life of an asset or a life of a vessel could be 35, 40 years, depending on how many people and how many companies may own it over that period of time from it being uh, new built. So the regulations invariably will change. Uh, and, and, and as I said, uh, you know, the International Maritime Organization has hit really, uh, uh, really one achievable uh, targets, but something that we have to do. And, you know, it's fair, uh, uh, half Dan mentioned it, uh, um, you know, it's, it's better for us, it's better for, uh, it's better for the people, it's better for profit, and it's better for the planet. We have to do it. We have to go there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we can retrofit solutions and, and over the life of a 30, 40 year asset, it's quite feasible to do so. Yeah. One, because we, we'll get, we, we have, we, it's, it's a carrot and a stick situation. The, the, the carrot says, look, it, it's feasible to do so and it's better for the planet, for the people uh, and, and for profit. But also the regulatory body says, here's the stick. You must do this. You cannot continue to sail this vessel uh, in the same sort of state that it is uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, so it's kind of, yes, yes, you know, we can, we can hybridize, uh, uh, electrify, but also retrofit current vessels. And, and I, I just want to, um, to note that, that uh, Ellen was designed from the get go to be extremely uh, hydrodynamic and lightweight. And that means that if you retrofit an old ferry, for instance, a couple of our old ferries we call shoe boxes, they are short and wide because when they were built, uh, the number of crew that you had to sail with uh, was determined by the length of the vessel, which is incredibly unfortunate in uh, for energy or uh, for energy use because then you have to push so much water. Ellen is basically designed and inspired uh, with inspiration for all sailing ships that glide through the water, and so you can't expect the same performance as we get that we get on Ellen on a retrofit. However, I will concur with, uh, or I will completely agree with what Dean said that. We have to we have to do things differently now, and if that means having an electric retrofit, which is, isn't doesn't perform quite as well as Ellen, well, that's too bad. At least we reduced emissions, and we have to do that. So I'm all for it. Thank you, gentlemen. And while we're on the topic still of uh, the technology, um, because I I do want to move a, a little into. Um, a question that we have concerning um, battery storage as opposed to hydrogen. But before that, um, just just taking advantage of where we're at now in the discussion, we do have a, a question on the life cycle of the batteries, um, the materials used. So I, I, I do know that LN, the materials used for LN include steel, aluminum, and even on your deck, recycled paper is that did I read correctly um, so the question here is what happens to them and that is that includes the batteries and also these materials that, that are used to to develop Ellen what happens to them after the life cycle is over Dean uh, can you yeah take certainly it? yes of course I mean the the uh, Svera touched on it uh, uh, very briefly in, in his discussion with regards to the, the state of health of a battery. Uh, you know, after a period of time, the state of health may be reduced to 80 or 75%. That doesn't mean that it's, it's done and it's ready to be 
scrapped. Yeah, it can be reused. It can be used uh, or repurposed. Yeah, it, it may not be able to drive Ellen the same way that it, it that it did in in year one, but it it doesn't. It still for there's still a significant uh, uh, volume of energy and capacity left in that in that to repurpose for whatever the case may be. Additionally, um, in in previous battery technologies, um, lead acid batteries. Um, are 99.9% .9 recyclable. This is a new technology. Yeah, we we will get there with regards to recycling the the batteries and 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 the repurposing and recycling of of these uh, um, is is certainly stage one. But we're progressing, uh, and I think from a, a Laclanche point of view, we we've already uh, have partners to um, uh, within within our uh, uh, portfolio and uh, and that we are aligned to that can deal with that in in the in the most beneficial way for the. For 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 people, planet, and profit, as as Charlene says, I love that. And if I can add, in an ERU context, we are actually now in a research project with the, the local university, um, or the the most local university we have we have to uh, to to see if we can and build a smart grid on on. Uh, in uh, in Sibri, where Ellen resides, because a lot of people have solar panels privately on their homes, uh, they have small wind solutions, and then we also have uh, Ellen with a lot of uh, batteries, and uh, those uh, batteries that no longer would be relevant for use on Ellen, they could be used used as a power bank to power the batteries. However, it's something that takes it takes expert. Uh, engineering skills to do we can't do it ourselves but we are very interested in the possibilities there's no reason to f throw away batteries like that uh, but, I, uh, but i think it's uh, it's important to know when you are reaching the end of the battery and you're not reusing it more you need to recycle it you need to dismantle it you need to, to take out uh, the copper and uh, the different materials. And uh, as I have understood the experience from uh, the car industry and the car batteries, it still costs more to, to um, reuse the minerals than the price you get from selling the minerals that you, or the metals that you have in the batteries. So, so there is some somebody talking about that it, maybe there should be a kind of deposit when you buy such a battery, you have to maybe put some dollars uh, in so that when it's going to be deposit, it in a way is financed from the first part. But of course, that's a political issue. So a perfect follow-up question uh, is one, is LN designed to allow for easily replaceable batteries? And um, even moving beyond um, LN, are you designing these vessels to allow for easily replaceable batteries so that new innovations in batteries can easily be swapped in as well as empowering the fast swap of batteries when in port? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can probably answer that to answer that question. Since Ellen, the technology um, it's not stopping. Put it that way. It's it's continually evolving. Um, the the and the capacity actually that we could that we we develop now in our in our current cell in our current module is about twenty percent, twenty five percent more than what was was um, was put into Ellen uh, at the uh, uh, at the forefront at the conception of, of, of the of the of the system that's in the same module size so the same frame size the same battery same size of battery pack I'm holding up uh, a phone there uh, in the same in the same envelope if you like we are getting 20 to 25 percent more. Uh, and that's that's almost year on year increase due to the technology and due to uh, um, uh, different chemistries, et cetera, et cetera. So in answer in answer to the, the question, we, we delivered, I think, 820, 50 kilo 
uh, batteries, uh, the, the make up uh, the 4.3 megawatt hours of, of, of Ellen. Uh, we delivered that uh, with uh, what we call a, a 40 amp hour cell. In 2021, we we're at 60 amp, 60, 65 amp hour cell. So a significant increase. Yeah, 30% 30, 30 increase. Uh, so basically, if we were to build Ellen now, backward compatible, we're getting something like six, six megawatt hours. It's really quite significant. And, and that, that continues to, to cycle onwards. Uh, and not only that, Sherlyn, but the reduction in cost um, is, 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 is quite significant year on year. So it's becoming more and more feasible in a smaller capacity. So I hope that answers the, the question in part. Yeah, I think I, I would just um, extend the question to, to looking at uh, easier management and, and deployment. Um, so as it stands, does Ellen allow for that um, removability of batteries? If I, yeah, um, I often guide people on the Ellen and, and I'm often asked, so where is the battery? Where can I see the battery? But it's not one battery. It's basically, uh, it looks like a, a very large car battery and they are racks. And so you can actually, you cannot just pull it out, but you can pull one out and insert a new one back in pretty easily. Uh, they are water cooled, so there are pipes running, etc. But in, it's 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 not like we have to split the whole ship and uh, and open it up or anything. We can just uh, replace individual modules. On 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 Ellen in, in particular, there is a there is a hatch where we can get down to the battery space, so we can bring out quite significant amount of modules very quickly and replace. You know, during during the midnight hours or during uh, you know early morning hours to to so that we don't impact operations very very quickly. Thanks, that, that definitely was useful. So I'm going to move a little away from the battery technology. And we have a question here um, that notes that Denmark has high amounts of wind power. And I think, um, half done, you would have presented that in your presentation. So the question related to that is, oh, has hydrogen been considered? And, and why not use hydrogen as the storage medium, given um, that wind capacity that you have, as opposed to what has been pursued with Ellen um, in terms of battery technology? Well, uh, I know this is uh, a hot potato in, in, in the area of uh, emission-free uh, technology, hydrogen or batteries. And my, I'm not an expert, I'm not an engineer, but the energy f efficiency of, of Ellen's uh, battery system is 85%. You, I, I don't think you would ever reach that with hydrogen. Also, you have to... Uh, you have to um, you, you have to refine it, uh, you have to uh, transport it, you have to store it. We have our six windmills out here, cables underground, the power runs right to the transformer station and right into Ellen. There's, it's really quite simple. And, uh, and uh, for uh, short sea shipping, as we call it, uh, I don't see a reason to, to go hydrogen really. Uh, because of all the extra things you have to consider and the energy efficiency. But uh, there's a new project now uh, with a private company building and uh, a, a ferry sailing from Eger to uh, northern Germany. And the range is going to be farther than, than uh, is probably going to be feasible with batteries now. So they, uh, that's, that's going to be hydrogen. I'm, I'm looking forward to see how it works, but uh, currently, I just don't see the reason to go to go hydrogen. We produce more wind than we need. Why why waste uh, energy converting it to something when we could just uh, charge Ellen directly? So maybe I could uh, add in there. Um, uh, I think that hydrogen is uh, a reasonable solution when you have a long distance travel because you can't charge that much energy in batteries. So for longer distance, that is an option. Uh, 
um, a, a fuel cell, uh, hydrogen driven fuel cell would typically have an efficiency of 50% and you will have the same the other way around when you use electricity to make hydrogen. So, so the, the efficiency uh, as such is rather low compared to used electricity directly. So, so uh, but you can't have uh, eons of, of batteries installed so then the hydrogen could be a solution and i know also now they are looking into use ammonia as an alternative uh, to hydrogen it's uh, looked upon as a little more safe even though it's uh, quite uh, explosive that also mm -hmm. We, we are, uh, sorry, sir. Uh, yeah, we, 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 with at La Clanche, uh, with uh, with our partners, we are looking into a hydrogen hybrid, as 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 both uh, Sfera and and Haftan said, to extend range, you know, uh, on a on a on a vessel in, in Scotland into Orkney. So, uh, and again, purely as a range extender, so it has battery and uh, uh, and, and hydrogen fuel cell uh, combination. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm going to pedal back and, and sort of revisit a question I was previously asked um, because it's coming up again in, in the small island developing state context, um, given that th there are fears that, that we suffer from economies of scale. And so the requirements of such small islands, are um, perhaps um, you would typically need vessels that are smaller than Ellen. So that is part one of my question. Um, we already did answer that, yes, they can um, be fe feasible, for small island um, developing states, but in terms of economies of scale, how much does that affect um, the small island uh, scenario where you may need uh, a ferry that, that, that holds 50 people and perhaps no cars to be specific? Um, and the second part to that question is particularly in that context and, and in general, uh, what is the, the cost uh, of uh, technology like Ellen versus uh, the traditional fuel-driven um, vessels. So th this question here, uh, looking at the capex versus, uh, and opex um, and a life cycle cost comparison, which I, I believe have done, would have already given us some insight into. I would just say that in our evaluation uh, report, uh, we have compared uh, Ellen, the cost of building a new Ellen with uh, the cost of building a new uh, diesel. Uh, and I will just uh, try to find it now because I can't remember the number. But uh, building a new Ellen is not, no longer significantly more expensive than building a, a diesel. Uh, and uh, about uh, buying a whole fleet at one point, I, I don't know. Um, may maybe, Dean, you can give discounts if, if they buy a a really big load of batteries, but but uh, but I'm I'm not quite sure to what to answer uh, to that. Sure, I mean I, I think maybe as you as you try to uh, uh, to to bring up that snapshot, I mean maybe the one of the the questions in retort to that, Sherlyn, is what's the cost of not doing it? Yeah, what is the cost of not doing it? We really need to make, and again, we 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 cannot continue in the same vein. Uh, in the maritime sector to uh, to emit the, the significant fuels uh, fuel and CO2 emissions that we are doing. Um, uh, it is comparatively, if we're talking about um, in comparison to a, uh, a car, then the battery system, uh, I, I can speak about the battery system, of course, but the battery system is not uh, um, uh, as cheap as it would be for a car, but it, but uh, and that's part of part of the reason is we have specific uh, uh, regulations to meet um, uh, and and safety of many many people uh, and and you know spare could uh, uh, wax lyrical about uh, that, but again it's down to. Uh, I think as the as the, as the the battery technology um, uh, and capacity increases and the cost comes down, then it's more and more feasible. We cannot, but we will not, and we have to look at total cost of ownership of a vessel, uh, you know, in the 30, 35 years. Uh, and, and maybe just to touch on, you know, the economies of scale, we're looking at uh, Ellen as a 4.3 megawatt hour system. We're all, we can also deliver batteries for uh, outboards, for smaller systems, for, for two or three people. 
uh, you know, this, it, it will become more and more the norm. Yeah, as the technology uh, as the te technology price um, um, reduces significantly. All right. So our next question um, again applies to uh, all island nations, um, but in particular, small island developing nations that are subject to harsh weather conditions um, and the, the most negative and adverse effects of climate change. Uh, so this question here is, what is the highest wind speeds that she can safely sail in? And that's referring to Ellen. Um, and how does she perform in, in severe weather? Um, if I can just uh, uh, go back, we have made a calculation saying that a new uh, type uh, diesel called LNG 50 would cost 14 million euros and a new e-ferry series would cost uh, 16.7 million euros. So we're talking 15% uh, uh, more expensive to, uh, to buy Ellen. But uh, those, uh, that extra expense, like, uh, like I said, is, is, is earned pretty quickly and uh, the life cycle costs are, are clearly on the e-ferry side. Uh, with regards to wind, what sets the limit is uh, the amount of, uh, bath bags that uh, the passengers uh, <laughs> are, are, are going to, uh, to uh, use if, if, if we don't uh, stay in port in, in really high winds. But it's not because uh, Ellen can't handle it, it's just because the passengers can't handle it. Interesting. Thank you very much. And, and just noting the time, I want to give the panelists um, an opportunity to leave us with um, some brief remarks, um, some closing remarks, um, your main takeaways, um, but most importantly, what you want our participants to walk away from this panel, remembering if nothing else. Uh, uh, so I, I, since I'm already unmuted, I would like to say that when I started, or when before I started working with Ellen, I was one of those people who actually uh, felt like this world was not going to end up a great place within not too many years. Uh, now that I'm working with Ellen and I see the solution, I see the reduction that is available. All our infra, all our buildings, et cetera, here are emission free. The last remaining hurdle is the ferries. Uh, we don't have planes on the island uh, except for a single, single small one, but the ferries can basically take away the island's uh, emissions. And that means we have to invest in Ellen four times altogether. So I want to say there's a solution. The solutions are becoming cheaper and uh, maybe we will save this world after all. You're wonderful, Dean. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, the transition has started. You know, conventional technologies are still going to be around, but they are transitioning away, and we cannot continue to 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 uh, to to continue the way that, that we have behaved. Uh, um, uh, you know, in, in previous years, uh, as I uh, as I. Um, was trained 30 years ago uh, as an electrical marine engineer. Uh, we were we were we were trained on on uh, diesel engines and and steam engines, and uh, we're not there now. We have the we have the technology ready. We're proving it in in places like Norway and uh, in, uh, um, uh, in Canada and, and other places around the world are grasping this technology. It's not a state of experimentation anymore. This is the new now. Yeah, we will grasp it. Um, you know, if if you said what was the number one car uh, in 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 America or in Americas, you would not say uh, five ten years ago it was it was a Tesla or or some you know or some hybrid. You, you wouldn't be there. We're going the same way with with the maritime with the maritime world. Thank you, um, and Sfera? Yes, um, I think that uh, it's important to know that. Uh, battery driven vessel is as safe as a traditional vessel. 
provided that it's designed correctly. And of course, the environmental footprint is much better. Thank you. And thank you so much to our participants. You've been um, an awesome audience, virtual participation at its best. Um, I hope we have answered most, if not all of your questions. Um, and I'm sure not, that now you're convinced, just as I am, that we had the best of the best on this panel. Let me take the opportunity again to um, recognize the efforts of Le Clanchet, the sponsors of this session, and likewise the organizers of this summit, um, James and his team at Island Innovation. Job well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much.